Hello, everyone, and uh, happy St. Patrick's Day. My name is Sean Henney, and I'm professor of English and Education at West Shore Community College. And the project I'm doing tonight, the presentation I'm going to be giving to you, is part of West Shore Community College's Humankind series. Um, the college made a commitment about three years ago or so, a little longer than that now, um, to help our students in our community explore different cultures. Um, the reason is to explore this question of what it means to be human by taking a look at what other people do in terms of culture and art and, and design and ways of experiencing the world. And we've covered West Africa, we've covered the Middle East, we've taken a look at Cuba. And this whole year we're exploring the British Isles, which is what brings us to our presentation tonight. Um, the Humankind series has uh, sponsored several different kinds of events, and, and you can check them out on West Shore Community College's webpage. But like I said, my name is Sean Henney, and what I do is I teach English and education at the college. Um, what makes me um, capable of, of speaking to you about Irish folk music, um, two things. One is I'm a scholar of, of Irish literature and culture. I have a degree in Irish studies from Boston College, and I try to bring as much Irishness into my classes as I possibly can. Uh, but beyond that, uh, I come from a very strong Irish-American family, and we've used my entire life and for generations before me, music as a way, one of the ways, to strongly connect with our heritage. So I know about the songs um, because I've studied them. But I feel about the songs, and I'm going to try to share my feeling about the songs with you because of my family. So for this evening, all of you are part of my family, and I'm, I'm including you in a family presentation of, of Irish folk music. So one thing that we're going to do is talk about each song. And so this, the tune I just played is a, is a tune by Tilako Carolyn. And he was an 18th century um, composer. He was a professional musician. And you can imagine what it might have been like to be a professional musician in the 18th century, which meant, basically meant he had to find patrons. He had to find wealthy people who would um, sponsor his production of music. And he wrote hundreds of songs. Um, quite a few of them are famous because of the name that the first word of the song would be Planksty. And that's a word I believe he coined. And it basically means a tribute to the patron or the host. And so a song called Planksty Irwin would mean that he was playing a song for Irwin, the host, and he would be paid for that. And that would be how he'd be compensated for his work. One fascinating thing about O'Carolyn is he was a contemporary of um, Bach. And so there's, an, there's musicologists and music historians um, like to point out some of the similarities between things that O'Carolyn was doing and what the composers on the continent were doing. But I'm not looking at that tonight. What I'm interested in are two themes that you can get out of that song. His song is that I played is called Shibigaga Shamor, and that means the, the, the uh, big fairy hill and the little fairy hill. And the themes that I'm looking at, one of them is about that word she which means fairy, but you want to think about that fairy being um, an otherworldly creature, not a diminutive one necessarily, but one that's got power and magic and stature that you can't quite reach. And this notice, this no notion of the other world, about things we can't quite reach, that's endemic to Irish folk music. There are things that we can't quite get access to, we really yearn for and we want them, but we can't quite reach them. There's a lot of that, and all the songs I'm playing tonight have some of that in them. But the other part of that song that matters to me, it's called Shibig Agus Shamor because there's two hills and they're having a conversation with each other. What O'Carolyn is interested in is the way the music plays back and forth. Da da, da da, da da da, da da. So the other thing I'm interested in is conversation. Where are, does Irish folk music feature conversations where one person is talking to another person and why are they talking and why are they communicating? And I think oftentimes it's because of trying to reach across that divide you know, that space between us that we're trying to get across. So I'm going to begin, I'll, I'll sing a song. Um, this first song I'm going to sing, it's called She Moves from the Fair. She Moves to the Fair, and it's a song from the Irish literary revival. So in the 19th century, at that point, the Irish had been culturally and politically dominated by their next door neighbor, by Great Britain, the island next door, for a long time. But in the, in the 19th century, beginning to come into their own, and beginning to produce a renaissance of, of music and art and culture. And one of the figures in that, in that time period, Padraig Cullum, put words to music and created this, this song. So a lot of it has poetic quality. It's the most literary of the songs I'm going to be singing tonight. And mostly it's a meditation on the love's distance. There are two figures in the song when we're having conversations. They're having a conversation with each other, um, anticipating and hopeful for a time when they can be connected to each other. 
but there's something in the way. And because it's a poem, there's ambiguity, and we're not quite sure what gets in between them, whether it's a, a loss of life or immigration, but something just keeps them apart. And so the meditation is on that. There's a lot of beautiful lines in this song. Um, for example, there's a line about a swan moving over the lake where, where Padre Colum picks up um, Irish folk traditions involving the mythology of swans. So that make, gives it some of its meditative quality. And you'll hear that um, when I play it. So this song is um, She Moves to the Fair. My young love said to me, my mother won't mind. And my father won't slight you for your lack of kind. She stepped away from me. She moved to the fair. She stepped away from me. She moved to the fair. Softly I watched her move here and move there. She went her way homeward with one star away. As the swan in the evening moves over the lake. People are saying no to where that one has a sorrow and it never gets said and she smiled as she passed me with her goods and her gear and that was the last I ever saw of my dear Well I dreamt it last night that my love she came in So softly she entered that her feet made no din she came close beside me, and this she did say, Well, it will not be long, love, till our wedding So one thing about that song, besides the, uh, the connection that they're trying to have, is that it takes place in a fair. And what we mean by that, so Ireland was an agrarian society for most of its history, and it still has a strong agrarian tradition. Um, but the people needed a place to gather to exchange the products of their subsistence agricultural labor for goods and services. And so that would take place at a fair, a market fair. And so there are plenty of Irish songs about that fair, and it means something beyond just the economic transaction, um, because in that case, you know, people that work hard and work almost exclusively all the time had an opportunity briefly for a while to gather together, not just for economic transactions, but for cultural experiences. You know, the place where music would have been played for sure was at the fair. Dancing and music and musicianship was all important there. But also it would have been an important social function um, for people to get together and actually meet each other and exchange information and news, to fall in love, to have courtship. Um, and so the next song that I'm going to sing also takes place at a fair for, for that particular reason. This song is called The Star of the County Down. Um, some of the things that are fascinating about it um, musically um, and lyrically is that the, the construction of the poem or the song is um, multiple rhyme schemes. There's internal rhyme and there's end stop rhyme. And as a consequence of that, it's a very uh, fluid and versatile song. And you can sing it multiple different ways. And I'm going to show you that when I, when I play it. Other things that matter about the song are its focus on place. That first song I played, um, She Moved to the Fair, is the only song I'm going to sing tonight that doesn't have a place name in it. 
In Ireland, there's a very strong tradition of identifying a song with a place, and the place almost becomes another character in the song. And you'll see that here, that the, where, she, where the woman in the song is from matters, and the way that she represents the place that she's from matters. She's from ba Banbridge Town, and that's going to be part of the song. So another piece of this um, is that the, the whole nation of Ireland becomes part of this because the song, again, is a young man, and the young man is focused on the unearthly beauty, in fact, the elven beauty, he says, of this young woman. And he says that she's um, more beautiful than anyone else in the, whole country, in the whole country of Ireland. And the way he does that is geogra geographically. And so he'll mention Bantry Bay, which is in the south of Ireland. He'll talk about Derry Kay up in the north. He'll talk about um, Galway over in the west and Dublin in the east and all the points of the compass. And so even though the, the, the song is very place-specific to a part of Northern Ireland, County Down, it actually pulls in geography from all over the, of all over the country. I told you this, this is a um, night about learning how to long for things and appreciating things that we can't quite have. Another interesting thing about this song is it has some Irish words in it. So the main language that most people speak most of the time in Ireland today is English. But there's also a very strong Irish language tradition there. And there are some, um, uh, every poet, poet in Ireland has to somehow wrestle with the idea that he or she is working in a language that isn't quite his own or her own and figure out how to come to grips with that. So the Irish over the centuries have made a version of English that's very Irish. And some of the reason for that is the vestiges of Irish words that remain in the language. So in this song, the, the woman um, comes down a barren green. And a barren green comes a sweet Colleen. And the word barren and the word Colleen are both Irish words. And one of the reasons why you know that is because the diminutive sound een, which just means something that's smaller. And there's an English word smithereens, which comes from Irish. You know, it's it's bro broken into lots of pieces, right? Smithereens. So a boreen then is a small road or a small track. She, she, sa she says she's coming down a boreen green, coming down a grass track on the way to the fair. Colleen would be a maid, but not just a maid, a call, but a Colleen right, a small maid, or a young maiden. And so there are vestiges of the Irish language, and you get this idea that the writers are trying to reach a language that they've lost some of and are trying to reclaim. So that becomes part of this song, too. So this is the star of the County Down. Once again, it's a, a love song trying to find connection with someone else. Here to Pembridge Town In the County Down One morning last July Down a board in green came a sweet Colleen and smiled as she passed me by She looked so sweet from her two bare feet to the sheen of her not brown hair Such a coaxing elf I'd shake myself to be sure I was standing there from Bantry Bay up to Derry Cay, and from Galway to Dublin Town. No maid I've seen like your sweet Colleen that I met in the county down. She onward sped, she I shook my head, and I gazed with a feeling rare. And I said, says I, to a passerby who's the maid with the nut brown hair. With pride, says he, and a smile, says he, that's the gem in old Ireland's crown. Katie Rosie McCann from the banks of our band is star of the county down. From Bantry Bay up to Derry Cay, and from Galway to Dublin town. No maid I've seen like your sweet Colleen that I met in the county down. She had a soft brown eye and a look so sly and a smile like a rose in June. And you hung on each note from her lily white throat as she built it an Irish tune. At the harvest dance, I was held in a trance As she ripped through the reels and jigs 
And when home she'd stroll, she could coax on my soul all the spuds from a hungry pig. From Banshee Bay up to Derry Cay, and from Galway to Dublin town. No maid I've seen like your sweet Colleen that I met in the county down. The harvest fair will be surely there, and I'll dress in my Sunday clothes. And I'll try sheep's eyes and elude in lies on the heart and a brown rose. No pipe I'll smoke, no horse I'll yoke, though my plow from rust turns brown. Tell the smiling bride by my own fireside is star of the county down. From Bantry Bay up to Derry Cay, and from Galway to Dublin town. No maid I've seen like your sweet Colleen that I met in the county down. So again, a song of conversation. He's not, not sure if he's going to have that conversation or not, but he certainly is planning to have it. <laughs> so I'm going to change gears a little bit. Um, that song is upbeat, happy, optimistic, joyful, um, and there's a lot of hope in the next song I'm going to sing too, but it's also about a tragedy, and there's plenty of tragedy in Irish history, and one of the major ones, and probably most folks listening to me have heard of this, um, was the famine that happened in Ireland in the 1840s. And so this is a famine song. Um, Irish historians debate over whether to call what happened in the 1840s a famine. Um, some of them prefer to call it the Great Hunger. A famine would be a time when there's no food available for anyone. Um, but the Great Hunger, and I'll explain why, um, there was only one kind of food that was not available to the Irish, but it was a big part of their, of their staple, um, and w which is one of the reasons why, for the tragedy. So what happened in the 1840s was a consequence of several things. One is that by that time, the English completely dominated the island and um, owned 97% of the land. And so the land was held by people who weren't from Ireland, and they um, operated through a tenant system. So most of the people in Ireland were farmers, but they didn't own their own land. They worked for somebody else. And as a consequence, their rent actually went out of the country. It went, the money that was um, produced from the farming would have gone to England. The other thing that started to happen was there became um, a larger desire for meat. Status was eating meat. The Irish people didn't have that status, but meat was popular in England, especially beef. And so raising cattle in the rich pasture lands of Ireland became important to the people who owned the land, who were English. And that meant if you were pasturing lots of cattle, there was less and less land for the farmers. The only way to make it possible to survive subsistence farming then would be to eat a very nutrient-rich and uh, calorie-rich food. And when the potato was discovered in North America and brought to Ireland, that became the food of choice. Because you could grow on a very small amount of land, which is what the Irish had left to themselves, um, enough potatoes to feed your family. So the challenge became when the potato crop failed. And that's what happened in the 1840s. So um, year after year, from about 1844 on, for, for several years then, the potato crop failed endlessly. And so never was there than the potatoes, which was what the main staple of the Irish people was. And as a consequence, the population of Ireland severely declined. Um, about a million people perished from hunger and malnutrition. Uh, millions of other people left Ireland. And one of the major waves of immigration of the Irish leaving Ireland and going other places was during the 1840s. Obviously, quite a few of them came to the United States. Um, Others went to Australia or to Canada, um, but they left the, they left the country. Um, so the population of Ireland declined from about 8 million people before the famine years um, to just over 4 million people at the end of that time period. So again, it was a major shift and a major tragedy. It was compounded, unfortunately, um, by the steps that were taken or the lack of steps that were taken by the British government to alleviate things. Um, they weren't completely heartless, but they were driven a lot by the popularization of laissez-faire capitalism and social Darwinism, the, the notion that um, people should be left up to their own devices and the market would sort things out. And so the measures that were taken were often not effective, and so people died as a consequence. This um, song that I'm about to sing mentions a man whose name's Charles Trevelyan, and he would have been in charge of the um, British efforts to alleviate the suffering of the Irish during the time. 
Um, they were ineffective efforts. He's fairly famous for having said that he thought that the famine was a divine retribution for, for social ills on the part of the Irish people. Um, it was an attempt to use corn, American corn, to feed the Irish people. That attempt did not go well, at least initially, because the ability to mill the corn wasn't present. And people didn't know how to use it. And so there's a reference in the song to Trevelyan's corn. So this song is a conversation. Again, it's a conversation between a man and a woman. Um, the first person speaking is the woman, and she is talking to her, um, to her estranged hus or her husband, who's been locked up in prison for the crime of trying to steal some of that corn to feed his family. The implication of the song is that he's going to be sent to Australia. The, the nation of Australia um, was at that point obviously occupied by the British as well, and they used it as a penal colony. So they sent people who had broken the law to um, Australia, and a lot of Irish people got sent to Australia. So there's a reference to Botany Bay in the song, and that reference is to the idea that her husband is going to be sent there. So a lot of longing again, um, desire and hope for reconnection, but what gets in the way is a public health disaster. And right now, we understand how that works, not to the level of the great hunger in the 1840s in Ireland, but the idea that we cannot connect with each other in ways that we want to because of a public health crisis is very real to us. So part of this song probably makes more sense to us now than it might have before. The song is called Fields of Athen Rye. Oh, one other thing I'll say about this song, it's really popular um, in the Irish sporting world. Um, and the reason for that is that the, the guy who wrote it, Peter St. John, he wrote this in the 1970s. Um, he, he sang the song at a, a football a soccer match in Glasgow, Scotland. Um, kind of Im improvised it or, or impromptu sang it. And one of the things that he was doing was acknowledging the fact that, that during the famine, um, hundreds of thousands of Irish had gone to Scotland to live in Glasgow because that's where there were jobs. And when he started singing the song, spontaneously, the, the people who were Scots, but they were from Ireland or their ancestry was Irish, all knew the song and they all started singing it. And as a consequence for that, it's become not just the song of that particular Glasgow football club, but also of all Irish, Irish national sporting events. And so at major Irish national sporting events, this song will be sung. It's got additional words that the sporting fans have added to it that I'm not going to, to sing tonight. Um, but it's a, it's got national status um, because of that. It's called The Fields of Athen Rye. By a lonely prison wall Heard a young girl calling She said, Michael, they are sending you away for you stole Trevelyan's corn So the young might see the morn Now a prison ship lies waiting in the bay Low lie the fields of Athen Rye Where once we watched small free birds fly our love was on the wing We had dreams, we'd songs to sing Now it's lonesome round These fields of Athen Rye By a lonely prison wall Heard a young man calling He said, now nothing matters Any when you're free Against the famine and the crown I rebelled, they ran me down Now you must raise our child with dignity Though lie the fields of Athen Rye Where once we watched small free birds fly our love was on the wing We had dreams and songs to sing But it's lonesome round These fields of Athen Rye By a lonely prison wall Watch the last star falling But that prison ship was framed Against the sky and she'll wait and hope and pray For her love in Botany Bay It's lonesome round these fields of Athen Rye 
Ola high, the fields of Athens dry, where once we watched small free birds fly. Our love was on the wing, we had dreams and songs to sing. Now it's lonesome round these fields of Athens dry. Ola. So, um, so that song teaches you a little bit about Irish history. The next song I'm going to sing teaches a whole bunch more <laughs> because it's a bigger scope of Irish history. The way this one works is that in the 1970s, um, a man named Peter Jones was uh, going through some family um, heirloom stuff in his home in, in Maryland. He discovered a, a treasure trove. What, what he found were some letters that had been written from um, his great-great-great-grandfather to his great-great-grandfather. They were letters from Ireland um, to the United States. And they detail quite a bit about what the Irish immigrant experience was like. And you remember what I'm making this, this presentation about, right? This notion of things that we can't quite touch and how we have conversations about that across significant amounts of distance. So the immigration experience is a lot about longing. Um, because what you think about here is, you know, the situation in Ireland was pretty poor. Um, things were not going well for the Irish to the point that quite a few of them left. Um, and those of you who have Irish ancestry understand that the reason we're, we're they're looking for someplace else is because things weren't good back then. But leaving a place like that that you care about, that you're committed to, that your loved ones are in, means that you're always longing for that, for that space or that, that connection. And so the song, this song is a lot about that. Along the way, as you listen to the way that the letters read, this is the, the father talking to his son through, through conversation, you also kind of anticipate the, the words back. You know, we don't have the letters back and forth. We only have the letters from the, the father to the son. But you can feel what the son said back, and you can feel some of the subtext. There are lots of subplots in this. You know, he talks about his sister, um, Bridget, and he talks about a friend, a childhood friend of his. Um, but so you'll, you'll pick up over the course of the letters the conversation and how the conversation worked and how the conversation was what kept their distance relationship alive. Um, lots of things uh, matter in this song about being Irish. Um, there's a question about potatoes comes up again. The question about burning peat or burning turf. Um, questions about an agrarian society, about who owns the land, what it takes to, to buy the land. One of the most interesting things is that the father comments that he's able to survive the way that he does because of the money that's being sent to him by his son. And you think about how that works, right? So for much of Irish history, the, the, the treasure of Ireland went to England because of ownership, land ownership. But then it was supplemented because when people came to the United States, they sent money back to Ireland. Um, and so that enabled the, the people in Ireland to survive. So you hear a lot about that in the song. Again, I think it means more to us now listening to this song because we've been dealing with the pandemic. You know, the, the inability for us to hold each other, to talk, to touch each other, to have conversations with each other, to sing around a campfire with each other. I sang that last song almost every time I've ever sung that song. I've sung it with my cousin Laura and haven't been able to for quite some time. So the the inability to connect with people in a real meaningful way. We can feel some of that during the pandemic and we can get this song better, but we can't come close to having an ocean and no FaceTime and no Zoom to be able to connect, right? So you can feel some of that, uh, the desperation of distance um, and this desire to connect in this song. The song's called Kilt Kelly. Remember I told you there are place names that matter and places become people in songs like this. Kilkelly, Ireland, 18 and 60, dear and loving son John. A good friend, the schoolmaster, Pat McNamara, so good as to write these words down. Your brothers have all gone to find work in England. The house is so empty and sad. The crop of potatoes is sorely infected third to a half of them bad the 
Your sister Bridget and Patrick O'Donnell should be married in June. Your mother says not to work on the railroad. Be sure to come on home soon. You kill the art. 18 and 70, here in love and son John. Hello to your missus and to your poor children. May they grow healthy and strong. Our Michael has got in a wee bit trouble. Guess that he never will learn. Because of the dance, there's no Turk to speak of. We've got nothing to burn Bridget's so happy You name a child for her You know she's got six of her own you Say you found work But you won't say what kind of When you'll be coming home You'll kill the yard 18 and 7, 80 Michael and John, my dear son. Sorry to give you the very sad news. Dear old mother's passed on. We buried her there at the church and killed Kelly. Your brothers and Bridget were there. You don't have to worry. She died very suddenly. Remember her now, your prayer. So good to hear that our Michael's returning. Gold is sure to buy land. The crop has been poor, and the people are selling at any price that they can. Kill Kelly are 18 and 90, here in loving Son John. I guess that I must. Be close on to 80 It's been 30 years since you've gone Well, because of all of that money you sent me Still living out on me own Michael has built himself a fine house Bridget's young daughters are grown Thank you for sending those family pictures Lovely young women and men Say that you might even come for a visit But joyful to see you again Kilkelly, Ireland 18 and 92 Dear Brother John Sorry I didn't write sooner to tell you Father's passed on. He was living with Bridget. She says he was cheerful, healthy right down to the end. Well, you should have seen him play with the grandchildren of Pat McNamara, your friend. And it's funny the way he kept asking about you, called for you right at the end. Why don't you think about coming to visit? Be so good to see you again. So I don't know why um, the uh, people who get in trouble are both named Michael in those last two songs, but uh, I'm going to pick up on the reason that they might have been. So, uh, so the. The Irish had a long and troubled history um, with their next-door neighbor, as I mentioned before, the island of Great Britain, and the English dominated Ireland for 800 years um, politically and economically and culturally. And getting out from under that was a long process that involved quite a few rebellions. And so a lot of Irish music um, are rebel songs. We call them rebel songs, and they're about the struggle, and it's about the attempt for Ireland to get political independence from England. And I deliberately didn't cho chose not to sing very many rebel songs um, tonight. I'm going to sing one that has been um, used as a rebel song, 
But I think that I'm going to show you a way to think about this song where it might not be only seen that way. So the uh, premise of the song, it was, it's, it's written uh, by Dominic Bean, um, who's the son of Stephen Bean, and the premise is about Stephen Bean and his experience. He uh, fought for the Irish Republican Army during the War for Independence in the in 1920s. Um, so the song is from his point of view, the father's point of view, and you get to hear about his um, frustration. A lot of those rebel re rebellions were not successful. In fact, most of Irish history, the rebellions failed. And there's a lot of pent-up resentment about that in the way that Stephen Bean is uh, expressing himself um, in this song. The premise of the song is that he's coming home um, from an evening at the pubs and he's been drinking. Um, he comes home tight. Tight would be the Irish word at the time for being drunk. Um, and he, in all of his frustration and anger um, about the inability of the Irish to gain independence um, is expressed in the song. And he'll mention things that uh, make some sense to us and some things that we might not follow real well. He, for one thing, he talks about the black and tans. The song is actually called Come Out Ye Black and Tans. So the black and tans would have been, um, well, most of them were World War I veterans, British World War I veterans who were jobless and dealing with all the things that soldiers deal with after a war. And they were hired by the British to augment the um, police force, the law enforcement in Ireland in, in the 19-teens, 1920s. Um, and as a consequence of that, uh, police brutality um, became endemic um, in, that, in that particular force. And so um, he uses the phrase black and tans, and that's what he's referring to. They're called black and tans because of, of their uniforms. But he also men mentions a litany of Irish heroes. Um, he talks about the heroes of 1916. This would have been one of those rebellions that failed. It's the Easter Rebellion of 1916. He names Charles Stuart Parnell. Charles Stuart Parnell would have been um, somebody who agitated for land reform, for the Irish to actually own their own land, and so to strengthen the economy and the people of Ireland. Um, he, so the naming of heroes, um, almost as if they were saints being venerated, um, is an Irish cultural tradition, and that both helps us to remember and think about the, the qualities of those heroes and what those heroes gave up for um, the country, but also it cements in a way of thinking about um, the culture in a specific way, and then it creates distance. And the reason why I think that matters in the case of this song is that the, the people that Stephen Bean is talking to, he calls them black and tans, and some of them may actually have been, but they weren't only that. They were Protestant neighbors of his. And so his frustration is being expressed and directed at neighbors of his whom he refers to as black and tans, but he basically paints them with everything that the English have done for 800 years to his culture. And the people he's talking to are Irish people. And this is the way the cultural divide works. You know, if you're sympathetic to the Irish Republican cause, then you um, adopt a series of heroes and ways of thinking about things on one side of the fence. Um, but the gulf and the divide, which is just across the street, um, means that those people on the other side, um, who are Irish people, are being um, accused and tarred with, with that, that broad brush. He also then brings in other kinds of cultural manifestations. The, the, he refers to Irish or to British imperialism. He explains that the, um, the British have dominated other cultures besides the Irish. He, uh, he also uh, mentions Kilisandra, which again, the place name, remember I told you place names become important, which would have been one of the places where there was a minor IRA victory, and, he, and that's important to him. So the, the poem is a, a longing for connection. He wants violence to be the connection. He says, come out, G. Black and Tans. He wants to fight, right? Um, but I think there's a longing behind that to escape from this pattern of, of not finding a way forward except for violence. And so I'm, I'm going to sing it that way and, and have, urge you to think about it that way. So the song is called, Come Out, G. Black and Tans. I was born in the Dublin streets where the royal drums did beat And those stubborn English feet, they walked all over us And each and every night, when my da would come home tight We'd waken all the neighbors with this chorus Come out, you black and tans, come out and fight me like a man Cheer your wives and you and medals down in Flanders Show them how the IRA made you run the hell away From the green and lovely lakes of Kilishadra 
Then did I hear you tell how you slammed the great Parnell You brought him down unduly persecuted What are those sneers and jeers that you loudly let us hear When the heroes of 16 were executed Come out your black and tans, come and fight me like a man Cheer away so you and medals down in Flanders Show them how the IRA made you run like hell away From the green and lovely lanes of Gilishadra Did I hear you slew them old Arabs two by two Like Zulus they had spears and bow and arrows But you bravely faced each one with your 60 pounder gun And scared the thief made us to tomorrow Come out your black and tans, come and fight me like a man Your wives and you want medals down in Flanders Show them how the IRA made you run like hell away From the green and lovely lanes of Kilishandra Well the time is coming soon and I think it's nearly here When the English foes shall flee or fly before us and if there be a need, well, our kids will say Godspeed for the verse or two of Stephen Dean's chorus. Come out your black and tans, come and fight me like a man. Dear wives, are you want medals down in Flanders? Show them how the IRA made you run like hell away from the green and lovely lanes of Killershad. to remember as he's talking to his neighbors. I don't know if uh, conversation can be a way to fix things instead of violence, but I, I'm, I'm thinking that that, poem, that song actually encourages that, reaching across um, a divide to find a way to connect. So uh, I wanted to, to bring that up because I think this next song illustrates this really, really well. So the song's called Claire to Hear. And it's a very popular and very powerful Irish song of immigration. It's about the Irish immigration experience. In this case, the Irish immigration experience to England. Um, but it's written actually by an Englishman. And this is why this matters to me. So it's an Irish song. It's Irish straight through and through. You, you hear, you'll hear this in any, hopefully it's being heard tonight in, say, Patrick's Day gatherings all across the country, right? In both countries. Um, but what happened is, in the 1960s, Ralph McTell, who, who wrote this song, fabulous songwriter, he wrote, his most famous, famous song is called Streets of London, which I encourage you to look up on YouTube and, and listen to. Um, but he also wrote this song, and the reason why he did so is because he was working at that time as a laborer in a construction site, and most of the other laborers were from Ireland. They were Irish people living in, in England at the time. Um, and listening to them talk, and listening to their stories of longing for the place that they were from, um, got ralph interested in writing this song and the point i'm making is through talking to people he learned a way to understand and appreciate a culture that wasn't his culture and was able to write a successful and very powerful song about that and that's the the point i'm making right across the divide these conversations that we have that we can see in this music and can show us ways to relate to each other so the song, um, what matters to me most deeply about this song is it really gets at the loneliness of and the isolation of being isolated or separated from your culture. And so the, the song is about Irish laborers who don't have an immediate connection to their home environment and are trying to figure out ways to cope with that. And some of their coping strategies, as you'll hear, are, are healthier than others. But what do you do in the face of not being able to touch each other or reach across to each other? And like I said, I think we, we understand that in ways that we might not have before um, this whole pandemic happened to us. So um, one word in the song that might be unfamiliar to you is the word crack. That's an Irish word for um, fun and um, joy and being with each other and conviviality and camaraderie. Um, and so that's maybe the only word you wouldn't maybe know in the song. Otherwise, it's pretty straightforward. Um, the song is called Claire to Hear. And uh, again, it expresses a longing for um, people that you can't touch. And so, clear to hear. What is for to share the room? And we work hard for the crack. Getting up late on Sundays, 
never get to mass. It's a long, long way from Claire to here. It's a long, long way from Claire to here. Oh, it's a long, long way that gets further by the day. It's a long, long way from Claire to here. Friday night comes around and then I'm into fight. My mom would like a letter home, but I'm too tired for writing. And it's a long, long way from Claire to here. It's a long, long way from Claire to here. But it's a long, long way that gets further by the day. It's a long, long way from Claire to here. The only time I feel alright is when I'm into drinking. Well, it eases up all the pain of things and levels out my thinking. In this long, long way from Claire to here. It's a long, long way from Claire to here. Oh, it's a long, long way that gets further by the day. It's a long, Away from clear here. Sure, it almost breaks my heart to think of my family. I promised them I'd be coming home with my pockets full of green. And it's a long, long way from clear to here. It's a long, long way from clear to here. It's further by the day. It's a long, lonely way from there to here. Well, I dreamed I heard a fiddler playing. Maybe that's an ocean. I dreamed I saw white horses dancing on that other ocean. And it's a long, long way from there to here. It's a long, long way from there to here. Oh, it's a long, long way that gets further by the day. It's a long, long way from there to here. So I hear that song, and I've, I've, I'm listening, and I hear my, my family singing it, particularly my cousin Pat. And, I suspect that maybe you heard some of that too. But the point of that, you know, it's a sad song and it feels sad. You can feel the loneliness of it, but there's a dream in there too. Um, just like at the beginning, the very first song I sang featured a dream. This notion that um, we can figure out ways to get over the distance. Remember I started out telling you about the, the distance between us and other people and the distance between us and our language or distance between us and our culture. Figuring out ways to get there, music does that. It helps us to figure out ways to bridge the divide. And I think that's the thing I most wanted to say about Irish folk music. I, I love the Irish drinking songs and the party songs and all those kinds of things that most people are listening to tonight. But I think these songs teach us maybe more about the culture more deeply in a, in a more um, intimate level. And I'm hoping that because you folks have experienced the pandemic, that there's some aspect of Irish culture that you now get uh, more intimately. And I'm not claiming, of course, that Ireland is the only uh, culture that has songs of longing and loss. Um, but um, to show the character of the way that the Irish experience that is what I was up to tonight. So I want to finish um, uh, with one last song. I want to thank some people. I, uh, right now, you guys can't see, but behind the scenes, uh, Amanda and Adam are, are making me look and sound beautiful. Um, so I greatly appreciate that. 
Um, Ted Malt uh, made it possible, created the space for me to be able to do that. He's my colleague, the music professor here. And so a lot of what I'm doing is not just me, right? The, the Humankind series, West Shore Community College, Adam and Amanda are making it possible for this stuff to happen. I encourage you folks to, to check out um, West Shore Community College's Cultural Arts and Humankind series because they're fantastic and some really great stuff is happening. You know, I'm a very amateur musician, but some beautiful professional, professional musicians are playing. Um, I'm going to finish with a whistle song. This is the, the last song I'll play. This song is called The Parting Glass, and I, I want to make a point about this song, too, um, about Irish cultural connections, because this is a very, very important Irish song. You'll hear this again. Almost a great many Irish concerts will finish with this song. Um, somebody will sing it, and it's a beautiful song, heard sung. Um, but it's actually, the words of it um, are Scots, and it's a Scots song, and our cousins, the Scots, um, came up with this, the language of this. Um, it's a song of, of joy. The last line of it is, good, joy, good night and joy be with you all. Um, but what happened is uh, a series of Irish people played this song and it became known as an Irish song. But it really shows reaching across um, and connecting to other people and how we borrow from each other um, and learn from each other. So the song's called um, The Parting Glass. And again, it's a, it's a toast to all of you on St. Patrick's Day. Um, thank you for, for listening to me and for participating a little bit in, in West Shore Community College's Humankind series. <laughs>